welcome. Um, my name is Heidi Swevens. I am the Director of Community Partnerships at Inclusive Arts Vermont, and I am here with artist Kate Adams, who is one of the artists in our masked exhibition, which is currently touring um, the state of Vermont. Um, for access purposes, I'm going to do a brief uh, verbal description of myself and surroundings. So I have blue eyes and pale skin with short brown hair. Um, I have, today I'm wearing a teal sweater with a hoodie and behind me is an abstract uh, piece of art, a painting with swirls and colors. I use she, they pronouns. Um, and I'm excited to be part of the Inclusive Arts Vermont team. Um, Inclusive Arts Vermont is a nonprofit um, that works with arts and education and arts and exhibitions. You can find more information about that on our website, uh, which is www.inclusivearts.vermont. Org. And Inclusive Arts Vermont is all spelled out. So that's I N C L U S I V E A R T S V E R M O N T dot org. Enough about that. Um, I want to pass this over to Kate Adams, who will introduce herself and uh, tell us a little bit more um, about her piece in Mask. Kate? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for honoring me, including me, and giving me this opportunity to share about my art and my process and about my piece called Hidden Grandmother, which I hope will be an honoring to my Abnaki ancestors. And uh, I am Kate. I am pale skin with uh, wearing reading glasses, but you know, I just, <laughs> a little addition that I need. My hair is long, slightly wavy. Um, and I have like a, what is it, <laughs> light green blouse on. I'm sitting on my brown couch and behind me is the walls of my cabin, which is wide board pine knot boarding, which, which I just love because it brings the outdoors of nature into right where I am abiding. And up in the corner is uh, an Abnaki prayer shawl that was given to me. It's black. It's basic black with fringes of red, white, and yellow tassels hanging from it. It was given to me by uh, my adopted Lakota sister, um, Verola Spider, in South Dakota. And I'll share more about that later. But it also has connections uh, to my Abnaki ancestry. Okay. Wonderful. We're so glad to have you with us today. And we thought we might start by showing um, the viewers the piece um, that is in Mast, which is um, called Hidden Grandmothers. So we have the wonderful Cat Redness behind the scenes working with Access. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so grateful <laughs> for all these younger women that know, have learned about the tech stuff <laughs> and are helping me learn. Yeah, and Kate, we talked about, um, you know, Kat will do a, a verbal description, um, and then because there's so many stories woven in with everything, um, please, we'll, we'll invite you to add your stories and share more after the description. All right, thank you. Hi, everyone. This is Kat. The verbal description for this piece is this is a horizontal image of, um, and the piece is an actual structural piece on the wall. It is a black frame with geometric shapes. Um, there are rectangle shapes uh, around the center. At the very center is a small circle with a raised um, with a raised circular shape, which Kate is going to tell you a bit more about. Um, at the perimeter, there are some openings of empty space that do not hold pictures, and there are five pictures at the center. Um, at the bottom is excuse the sound of a truck going by. At the bottom, there is. Um, twine made from animal skin hanging down. Um, and I believe those are deer hooves that are attached to it. And there is also a braided um, yellow and orange bracelet coming from that. Um, and the top left picture is a piece of fabric. Um, and at the center is the shape of a uh, bear skin laid out on kind of a, a rust orange, deep red um, color. And a Around that are small orange um, orange ribbons, similar to like an awareness ribbon um, that we think of, you know, the pink ribbon for breast cancer. Next to that is a um, 
is a frame of that same orange ribbon in a larger size. Um, to the right of that uh, on your screen is a photo of Chief Don Stevens, and he is wearing a, um, a hat with beading around the forehead, and above it is uh, kind of an orange textured fabric. There uh, are trees behind him coming down one side of his face are feathers. He is wearing glasses around his neck. He is wearing, um, I believe, a bone necklace. And then he is wearing a jacket that has embroidery on both of the lapels, a uh, floral embroidery. Below the picture of Chief Don Stevens is the picture of a young girl standing at the edge of um, a kind of marshy water. And her back is to us and she has long dark hair. She's wearing red clothing and there are sort of water edge greenery all around her. And she's watching ducks move away in the water from her, a mama duck and baby ducks. To the left of that is a picture of a young man, a, a, you know, a teenager um, standing very close chest to neck to a dark horse who's wearing a bridle in one hand. Um, he is holding both a helmet and he's holding the reins to the horse. And at the center is the picture of an Abnaki woman um, who is carrying baskets on both of her arms crafted baskets um, and they're kind of slung over her arm as she's carrying them. Um, and that is, that's mine. And Kate, feel free to add anything you'd like to that description or uh, I'll let you two chat about it. Okay, thank you. I think you did very well. And I would like to share a little bit more about the images and my process for choosing to do this art piece. Uh, I. I have loved doing photography, being in the outdoors. I think that tradition of the outdoors and photography came from my paternal father. And, and then uh, about six years ago, I realized about my maternal Abnaki ancestry, that it was real, that it wasn't just as I suspected. And, um, so the image in the middle is actually uh, a photo that was taken at a horse show when I was doing costume class and I was riding my horse dressed as an Abnaki woman. And this is my stepdaughter where I, I had her in the tire and carrying the, the baskets. And so when I saw the notice for the mast exhibition, it was in a paper that comes to the mailbox and it was only like two weeks before the deadline. And I was at a place where I was wanting to share more of, of my photography, of the images of nature and the images that I've taken of indigenous people, both uh, Abenaki people here and friends and family that I've gained in South Dakota on the Pine Ridge Reservation. And so I could have chosen to just say, all right, I wanna just take one of the pictures of the Canada geese with the little gosling sticking its feathers out from under it. And, and it would have been much simpler because I realized that I qualified for the mast exhibition and uh, with several areas that are called disabilities. I am ADH different and I refuse to use the D for disorder. I say different or dilemma. <laughs> and I also have been um, diagnosed with complex PTSD, which is even more complicated than regular PTSD. So my life has been an ongoing journey of seeking healing from the unhealthy effects of some of the trauma experiences and the nature going out in nature and the taking the images is very soothing for me helps me to connect out beyond helps me get out of the mind where some of those rut thoughts get all snarled up help help my heart to heal by being out in connection with mother earth and, and I call it going out in God's cathedral. 
um, and then I realized that also Inclusive Arts Council and this exhibition was including people with indigenous ancestry. And I have been hesitant to talk about my Abenaki ancestry. And I'm purposely using the, the pronunciation of Abenaki rather than Abnaki. People use one or the other. But I prefer Abenaki because it's more of the Algonquin pronunciation of those letters, whereas Abnaki, I feel, is more of an English pronunciation. So I use Abenaki. Um, and yes, I will probably be, I'm a little slightly nervous doing this. But that's all a learning process and a growing process. And so I chose to honor my hidden grandmother. I chose to acknowledge that part of my ancestry. And the staff at Inclusive Arts Council were so wonderful to me because I struggled. You know, those of us with ADH difference, there's some places, ways we are absolutely brilliant and creative and intuitive and love relationship and connection. But the administrative parts that are easier for some other folks in our culture, we just somehow, that's the way we are. And I had, I was only diagnosed with that about 12 years ago, but it helped explain a lot. And I needed to learn to accept that there's some things I'm really gifted at and there's some things that are a challenge and I need to ask help. That it's okay to ask help for those pieces. And the folks at, uh, like Heidi, were wonderful because I'd call with a question and I'd call with saying, wait a minute, I don't like this word disabilities. <laughs> I've been in a journey where I've tried to shift away from that word. Um, but she listened and and I've gained even more of a process in that. So I'll continue to use the words that were different. Um, and and it is can be a challenge and it can be a dilemma for us. It can be a dilemma for others trying to understand us. But this process has given me a wonderful continuing artistic and emotional and heart and brain process to come to more clarity and more comfort with celebrating who I am and to be able to celebrate my uh, Abenaki ancestry. And so when I was putting it together, I wanted the circle frame because it would represent medicine wheel, sacred circle. I was going to try to make one from scratch, but boy, the time limit, I like, ah! <laughs> when I found one at Hobby Lobby, I said, ah, thank you. <laughs> and I bought it. <laughs> I knew I was going to be able to include four of my images, not have to submit just one. So that was a blessing. And um, I knew I wanted something to represent my hidden grandmother because um, the people of my family may have come from New Hampshire at first, moved up to Northeast Kingdom, many went into Canada, went into hiding. And my great-grandmother Carr um, was of the Carr family, which was that area, Woodbury, Danville. And I suspected I might be a Benaki. I love to do rendezvous, which is pre-1830s, and I would dress as an Abenaki woman to honor my grandmother. And it wasn't until about six years ago that I was living in Bellas Falls and went to a genealogy class and was doing research. And it made sense to me now the one family story I remembered from my mother. And that story was saying that Grandmother Sanders, her maiden name had been Carr, used to hate it and be very angry if anyone called her son an Indian, All right? So I suspected that meant that maybe she'd married a native and that was in the ancestry. And yes, he looks native, <laughs> but she didn't want him subjected to the racism. And uh, <sighs> so this one story, one family story is, that she was trying to protect my grandfather and my, my grandmother, my mother, which then became my mother and my uncle. Um, 
And in doing the genealogy, I realized she's the one that's a Beneke. <laughs> and I realize now how much she has blessed me when I finally was able to acknowledge her and all of those of her family and before her. And so when I got to the middle, I, I said, well, I was trying to figure out, they didn't have, I didn't have any round wooden circle to put in the middle, which was to represent my hidden grandmother. And uh, of course the title is masks and, and what that means for us. And so I was like, how do I express the masking that, that a Beneke and other indigenous people have had to do to survive in a different culture? And so I chose <laughs> the lid to a jar. I thought, all right, that'll fit right there. And I can paint it black, put it right in the center. And then I put that image that represents my grandmother in the middle. And so now she's coming out of hiding. <laughs> oh, thank you. Could, could we? Could we go back just to the image uh, the hidden grandmother image again or not? Or... Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So, so I just want to share about some of the other images. The girl, I think in a way represents me. It's actually a neighbor that has come and been learning about horses from me, but that's my farm pond and ducks. And I just felt it expressed me and other children who have still this curiosity and thrill of life and creation that's out there. And that was me as a child. I used to try to crawl through the hay field to be able to get closer to the deer that would come out to graze in the evenings. So that represents the child part of me. Above is Chief Don Stevens of the Nohegan, a Beneke tribe. And he and others, there's now four recognized by the state tribe or bands in Vermont. Um, they have been really working a lot in the last years to try to collaborate and be able to bring awareness and recognition and bring back at least more rights to um, the people. And so this was taken at a gathering at Lake Eden in usually the fall. And so I wanted to honor him and to express him and he and the leadership of others who have dared to step forth and try to say, this is who we are. We have been here for hundreds of years. We've been here for thousands of years. We have been caring for this land and our people for all of that time. And then as you look to the left of it is where uh, the bear cub is. And that is actually the skin of a bear cub on a red blanket with the ribbons, like she said, similar to cancer awareness. Well, at the time that shortly after I became aware of this exhibit, I became aware of my own daughter's uh, diagnosis of cancer. And so it expresses a poignancy of two things. The, the prayer ribbons around it are a prayer for all those, especially the children, that we now have become more aware of that have died in places where they were taken from their families and taken to places where they just disappeared. Um, and so that is an honoring and a prayer and a recognition that for more healing to happen, we need to look at the real and the authentic and bring awareness, bring prayers for healing, seek reconciliation, and to be able to stand with boldness. And so as I look down at the picture below it, that is of my grandson, Gabriel, who's 15, the son of my daughter in her struggles with her health. That is my horse that I've bred and raised. His name is Black Hawk. But his nickname is Houdini Hawkster, because if you didn't know it, even horses can be ADH brilliant and mischievous. And in this image, 
you see this natural connection this young man has with the animals in this particular spirited horse. And what a comfort to him when he comes to grandmother's farm that he could get out of the vehicle and he goes right to the horse pasture and to his special friends there where he could share and talk and play. And so all of these images are very meaningful to me, you know, of family, of creation, of the ways of gentleness and generosity of the Abenaki people, the people that have but care, were caring for this land for many, many years. And now as we deal with so many struggles, one of the reasons I wanted to get my photography out more was I couldn't stand some of the stuff on Facebook. It was so disturbing. It's so distressful. I said, I want to do what I can to put images out there that might be a comfort, might be a learning, might be um, a healing for folks. And so that is what my hope is, that this, this image, uh, people will view it from their different perspectives, their different experiences. It may mean different things for different people. Uh, but I hope that people will find a sense of hope and peace. And thank you. Wonderful, Kate. I'm just gonna pause for a minute if that works for you. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, we're getting a drink, yeah. Um, yeah. that, um, so much, uh, reflection and beauty and story. And thank you for adding that to the piece that's, you know, in the show, um, just the richness of it. Um, I was remembering that you, um, have with you today, you, you brought the jar. Do you have the deer hooves too? Um, I don't have them in hand, but they will okay. be brought to be okay. a part of the exhibit when it goes to St. Johnsbury. Okay, great. Um, and we have a whole, um, not a whole, we have a number of other photos that you've um, shared. And I'm wondering if you want to find another photo to continue on with the story. Uh, yes. Okay. Because um, I know there was a couple that you wanted to make sure we got to. Um, and as you're telling about the photos, you're, you're weaving the story about your creative process, about where you find inspiration. <laughs> so um, we'll get there. Yeah, okay. All right, yes, this, uh, I think I've hinted about horses as a part of my history, okay? I was a horse crazy, well, now I won't use those words, horse crazy. I finally at a retreat somewhere said, no, I'm not horse crazy, I'm horse healthy. Horses help me be healthy. But I really wanted a horse, I begged my parents, I earned money. I fortunately was able to buy <laughs> <laughs> this really cheap, unbroke mare for $200, God, however many decades ago. But you see, my grandfather, the son of my grand great-grandmother, Carr Sanders, was a prominent, he was a horse man. He, he had horses, he had a stallion named Canuck, and he even would go to the Heartland fair and do tricks. I mean, Canuck would do rearing and tricks and jump through a hoop of fire. And my mother and her brother would be on ponies. So there's see so much more connections for me, you know, not only the nature and the, with the animals and with the deer, but with horses also. And so I've been sharing my horses for years because I know how they've helped me. And so I've shared them with others. And uh, I found a book called Lakota Horses, Healing of the People, and I read it, and there was a chapter in there about the youth sobriety ride that got began by Lakota women wanting to get their youth connected to the horses of their culture to help keep them from the temptations of the alcohol and the drugs and the abuse that are all around them on the reservation, okay? And so I, I wanted, I researched, I didn't know how I was going to get there. I made some calls, made some connections. Things were all very guarded, but I thought, I want to go see this youth sobriety ride. I want to go offer to volunteer. So I won't tell you all of how that happened, because that was a long journey to even get there and to do so with respect. 
so that I wouldn't, because see my features, I look like a white woman. All right. And, and I have learned, this was before I knew for sure of my ancestry. And I know how many of the indigenous really resent those that they call the white wannabes. Okay. And, and the white culture that come in and take and well, even coming to take pictures, people would say, oh, we'll send you the pictures and never did. So I was very careful that when I did get to finally go, and I took a lot of pictures, but I'd ask permission. And I'll say, you have delete privileges. So if you don't like what I take, we get to delete it. And they wanted to know, what are you going to do with these? Well, I put them together into a slideshow and into an article because I wanted those youth to have something about their ancestry. They could feel proud of themselves. And here they are on their horses under the leadership of Chief Mel Lonehill, who became sober because somebody else grabbed him on a four-day sobriety ride. And he came back sober. And he stayed sober. And so he kept doing this ride. And, and I just am grateful that, uh, that I met him and connected with him. Fortunately, he's gone, he's gone on now. I did go back for a couple more rides to help. They were kind of surprised that I was a white woman coming willing to help, willing to cut the buffalo grizzle, willing to go serve the food, willing to take the coffee to the guys. And uh, But it was a profound healing experience. And the Lakota, the horsemen of the plains, during the 1800s, they were known as the world's best horsemen. Okay, they... They outdid, outran, outmaneuvered the cavalry for many years. And it wasn't until the means that were meant to eliminate them, the genocide attempts, basically, is what it is, to annihilate the buffalo, which is your food source. When they did capture them, they would slaughter all of their horses and then put them on the reservations and tell them, learn to live like a white man, okay? Mm. Um. Then I learned about Chief Orville Looking Horse, who is the leader of the whole Sioux Nation. But we don't like to use the word Sioux because that was given to them by their enemies to the French. Sioux means snake. Their name for themselves is Lakota, Dakota, Nakota. So I only say that because there may be people that only think of them as Sioux. So if you want to know who I'm talking about, who you've seen in the movies, read in the books. All right. But authentic history is really fascinating. And I love searching for the real history and the real story. And so I learned, I have a friend, my other Lakota sister, Catherine Grayday, um, knows Orville. And there was going to be a water, I protect the allies. Here's another blessing of reconciliation. Cowboys and natives made an alliance. And they wanted to do a protest in Washington, D.C. to protest uh, the Keystone Pipeline. Now, they were bringing all these natives to Washington, D.C. They were going to be in the green. They were going to have teepees. Well, what they don't realize is that native people, even someone in his role, doesn't have a lot of financial resources. They were going to pay for him to get there, but they weren't going to provide housing. They weren't going to let them stay in the teepees. And so... I'm trying to decide, do I go to Washington? Do I go to South Dakota? Well, I'm glad I went to South Dakota because what happened was Chief Orville Looking Horse said, well, we can't go to Washington, D.C. We will have our own prayer ride here. Mm -hmm. And so that image as a Chief Orville Looking Horse with others with him on a horseback prayer ride, because when they ride their horses, it's also a form of prayer. It's a horse's four legs on the earth. And he was riding, they were riding together to go to green grass and to the grounds where he said, well, we will have our own water ceremony here. So he did a ceremony of the white, he's the 19th generation keeper of the white buffalo calf woman pipe, which is another whole story. Okay. So I was honored. Catherine took me up to travel because I didn't have the means for a rental car. So she took me up there. We got to sleep in the teepee. Um, I was allowed to go and be uh, smudged and purged in the, and, and prepared and be able to be present for the ceremony, but you're not allowed to take any photos of those sacred ceremonies. So you won't see images of the, but 
Chief Orville Looking Horse is one who, who would say, uh, Mother Earth is a source of life, not a resource. And, and I've just learned a lot. I, I had a chance when they did a World Day of Prayer and Peace in New York. He let me know about it, and a friend and I went, and we got to interview him. And uh, so there's much of the teachings that I find are very harmonious with what I learn about the ways of the Abenaki. And I've already been reading, researching many of the ways of the people before I knew, oh, I really am of this descent. And and I, I, I would read and learn and anything I can about the ways of these people. And um, so what I want to tell you, I, I need to shorten it. I know I can get telling stories. I think I, I am a storyteller. I've realized that's one of my gifts in, the, in, my, in my native community is I'm a storyteller <laughs> with images, with words written and, and speaking. So I appreciate that you're giving me this chance to tell stories and that it opens opportunities for more stories because that image is one that is is now right is at an art gallery, the first art gallery exhibit that I've been a part of in decades. OK, um, at at the uh, the gallery at the vault in Springfield, and it's titled Traditions of the Lakota and Bedeke People. And um, so I will have opportunities through that to share more of what I've taught, what I've learned, and, and wish to share with others. Okay, <laughs> that's enough about Chief Orville yeah. Looking Horse. Um, well, I wanted to just um, bring in two things. Um, okay. Thank you for the stories. Um, and uh, I'm wondering, I'm not sure if the image that you're talking about that um, is at the vault was actually shared yet. And the one before, I don't think oh. I've ever been. So what if we, does this work for you, Kate, oh. if we bring up the horse image and Kat will describe that and then the, the other one um, that's at the vault. Yes, this, this is Chief Orbo looking horse. That is at the okay. vault. Yeah, okay. And in your stories are part of your art and creativity and, and gifts. So th that's why we're here to, to just- Okay, thank you. Yeah. But yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry to folks that we didn't describe this to you first, but- that's okay, Kate. So yeah. what we have brought up here is a square photo. Um, in the background is a beautiful blue sky with fluffy white clouds kind of rolling in the background. In the foreground is an indigenous man with um, a red shirt with across the chest in a horizontal line um, are what looks like ribbons or embroidery across the chest. Uh, he is wearing uh, a headpiece that is made of fur and feathers and horns. Then there are also ribbons and feathers coming down from the side. He is facing, his shoulders are kind of turned um, slightly away from the camera and his eyes are facing down and there are feathers and um, seen off the back of his headpiece and then off the back also of his uh, shirt coming down with these tail feather tails coming um, and blowing in wind behind him. Thanks, yes, Kat. that's, that's, yeah. that's yeah. good. And what he's wearing, the fur, that's a buffalo, buffalo and buffalo horns. So he's wearing a buffalo headdress. Yes. Wonderful. And Kate, did you also want to show the picture of the horse with your, this one? Oh, sure. Since it's there, let's do yeah. it. <laughs> And you, you mentioned horses, so, um, and family. Yeah. Yes, and this is, uh, like I said, I'm often taking pictures of others. <laughs> and I lost a dear horse uh, last fall. It was actually a full sister to this horse that's pictured. And I said, gee, I have all these pictures of other people with my horses. There's hardly any of me with the horses. So I said to my husband, John, I said, take a picture of me with Gabe and Hawk. So I'm glad to <laughs> have this image. Uh, this again is Gabriel. He is the one in the image of the hidden grandmothers. And, and this is the same horse, Houdini Hawkster. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you could just see from his, his expression, his hands on him, there's a really uh, wonderful relationship, partnership between these two. And uh, 
This horse is ADH. People are surprised that horses can have different personalities and gifts and challenges, but this horse has helped a lot of others, uh, boys, especially that have come to my program that have been in special schools because they couldn't make it in the regular traditional schools. Uh, often if I let them go out in the pasture, they find this connection with Hawk. And we celebrate the gifts of who they are. And we acknowledge the things that are challenging and then we work on the skills uh, to improve what we need to. And uh, so this is a special image. And this is an image that is now used for my profile shot. I have a woman uh, who's volunteering here at my program who rides with me. Um, and it's helped her survive the pandemic of being able to come be with horses. And she's better with the tech stuff. As Heidi knows, the tech stuff is a challenge for me, <laughs> but I'm gaining, hooray. And uh, she has started the Scutney Mountain Horse Farm Facebook so that we can share about our program and I can share more of my images. And uh, one of the things I'll say to the, the children that come, not only children, an adult, I had, uh, well, one of the reasons I'm trying to move into this realm is be because bef of social media is because before the pandemic, I I'm on retirement income and it's not a lot. And um, so I was substitute teaching because I have been an educator, worked with special needs and love teaching, but I don't, I would not do, I could not go back to public school. I could not do it that way. Okay. Um, but I was substitute teaching to bring in enough money to be able to feed my horses. And then the pandemic, and of course, with my medical and age risk, it was like, all right, I'm not going into the school. What happens to me if my if, if I get sick or die? What happens to my horses? And then my daughter's diagnosis, like, I got to stay, I got to do what I need to to stay around. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, I've got to learn some of these other things, the social media as a way. Um, but when I was substituting, I went into the teacher's room and there was a paraeducator there who was having a tough time because she was getting texts from her son about bullying at school and the administration, she didn't feel was dealing with it sufficiently. And I was going to be having an open barn the next weekend to start up my program again. So I said, well, you know, my horses and I have helped some other teens dealing with bullying. You want to come? Well, she came with her three kids. They were so surprised at my approach because my approach is not what I call the colonizer, conquer, control, and you comply or else mode, okay? We, my approach is about connection, about communication and connection, understanding horses, ourselves, how to be around them in a respectful way. So it's mental, emotional, heart, and spiritual. And that's how some of the healings come to some of the people that come. And so she's here and she's struggling. And Blake just goes in the stall with Hawk and spends half an hour just talking to Hawk. Okay. And Hawk totally, you know, Hawk just listens. <laughs> anyway, so they keep coming back. And then I realize, oh, he's also ADH. And so we talk about that and affirm him in that role, but understand he has struggles at school with teachers and students that don't understand. And then I realize to the mother, I say, you know, I think you maybe ought to check out whether you're ADH. Have you ever asked that question? And she is, she's now diagnosed with ADH. And so at least it helps her understand and not be quite so self-judgmental about the things she doesn't do well. And she's a wonderful photographer, by the way. And so I'm able to affirm those things that she's gifts at. And she's very gifted with the children she works with at school with their differences. And so when someone comes and I can sense their ADH different, what I'll say to them is, oh, I could tell you what I know about you. You're brilliant. You're curious. You're creative. You have lots of energy if you're my kind of hyperactive. And there's the non-hyperactive too. And um, you're intuitive. You like to be creative. But you can get bored really easily. And you do not like being bored. 
Okay. But the other thing is some of the administrative, there's things about how you function or don't function well, either the distraction or the administrative skills in your way your brain works that don't fit the traditional school methods. Although the schools are getting better. Okay. Grateful for that. Um, but I'll, say, I'll tell you something else so I'll know about you. It is hard for you to focus sometimes on what other people want you to focus on or what you think you should focus on. But if there's something that's very, very important to you, you will focus and you will persevere long after when other people would have quit. And so I say to him, so that's why I'm still doing what I'm doing. When other people told me, you're crazy, Kate. Okay, it sounds like you have so many rich places in your life where connection and creativity and nature and people, um, where there's an exchange, you know. Of yes, and it's part of my healing journey. It's a part of my learning journey. I've learned so much from creatures, okay? And that's the that's way of the indigenous people, too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's so much, and there is beauty out there. And so it, with the confines of all of what's happened, so like even when, when I post on a local Facebook an image of the sunrise or of my duck splashing in the pond and I get a hundred likes, I know that that has brought an image of beauty or humor or a smile to someone that day. So it, it gives me a sense of value. They're not just thousands and thousands of photos that I've taken that are lost in my clutter. <laughs> um but I'm learning ways to share them and um, hope that I, that could be encouragement to others. And I, I would just like to encourage any of you that if, if you have, well, I guess the, the word I use is differences, but I realized when Heidi and I were talking, I thought, wait a minute, in horse racing, they have a phrase called handicap. And I used to hate the word handicap. And then I didn't like the word disabled either. And I've realized uh, for conversation with others that it's like, it makes a difference if how it's used, okay? If it's used in a way that's as a judgment, either someone's judging me as being inadequate or not able, or if I'm judging myself because of what I've heard from so many others, then I cringe at it. And I think it's healthy for me to say, I'm going to stand up and speak another way. Mm -hmm. uh, and in handicap racing, they'll take two horses and one horse may have already proven he's the faster horse. And they want to have a race between the two of them. They will put a handicap on the rider of the faster horse. He'll have to carry extra weights. And so two horses are racing. Everything's the same except that one has got extra weights. And those that are watching or betting on the race have to look at all the factors of each and, and try to decide which one is going to overcome their challenge, whether they're already considered the slower horse or if they're considered the faster horse, but they've got a handicap. Okay. And somehow that has just made a difference for me that. I'm still a good horse in the race. <laughs> <laughs> and even yeah. with a handicap, I'm going to run a good race and give it the best I can. And I may well win. And if I don't, I'll still learn from it and I'll enjoy the joy of running. Mm. Uh, Kate, thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm smiling, but you probably can see. <laughs> It's just me who can't necessarily see when somebody's smiling. Um, and I'm, I'm smiling I'm too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm grateful that um, for this time that people get to learn a little bit about, more about you and your art um, and, you know, the journey that you and the learning that you just always seem to be engaging in. Um, even when, you know, like we both share the tech challenge thing, um, <laughs> it, it's not always there. Um, we have just a few minutes left today. So okay. I'm wondering. If you want to um, let folks know where they can find more about your art, if they want to um, learn more. I know it's at the vault right now. Um, and where else can people find more about you if they want to stay in touch? 
And um, when we go live, um, and later those will be posted in the chat box, um, but for, for now, we'll just say it out loud. Okay. Do you mind if we show that other image of the oh, woman? Okay. Not at all. No, thanks because she me. she's a Beneke and um, oh, thank you. yeah, yeah. I I took this image at one of the Nalhegan gatherings at Lake Eden. This is uh, Carrie White, who is a basket weaver. She is working on preparing the strips from the ash trees. Um, and I, I had wanted to have her image with what I had at the vault, but my administrative challenge. I hadn't gotten a permission form or verbal from her yet. Um, so I'm glad it's here because I just want to share uh, this image that speaks of the various beauties and gifts of the tradition of the Abenaki people. And yes, you can see more at, at the vault. I think it's, I'm going to be giving a talk there May 14th which will be more hands-on. <laughs> um, and I do have the Escutney Mountain Horse Farm Facebook site. Um, I haven't gotten the challenge of a website set up yet, but I actually have had someone else who really loves what I do and share and has offered to help me set up a website. So that will come eventually um, because I want to continue to explore the ways that I can share these images and uh, share people's stories. Wonderful. And Kat, would you do a brief verbal description of this image? Oh, sorry again, I forget. No, this. no, no, no sorry. Kate at all. all right. oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> learning, <laughs> learning process, learning process, yes. We're all in this together in community. So this is a square photo against, uh, there's wood behind it. And in the wood you um, visible are some nails and around the nails, the wood is a slightly different color. Um, the main image is of a woman that Kate was just talking about. She's looking down as she is um, bending wood for basket making. Um, she has salt and pepper gray hair pulled back. She wears uh, glasses, wire framed glasses. Um, she's wearing a top that is a deep teal with it looks like a black or navy flower pattern on it. And um, similar to the ribbons that we saw in the others, um, there is also ribbon sewn into across her upper chest, over her shoulders and down the sides of the chest and at kind of the uh, where the arm meets the elbow, there's also ribbon. And so her hands are in front of her working on this basket. There are also various tools in front of her uh, for basket making. And behind her are these very new spring green, that chartreuse green color of the brand new growth um, and a lot of ferns and foliage behind her. She is also on her chest uh, is visible two different necklaces um, and they look like they're either stone or bone and then she's also wearing earrings that are coming down and the two pendants around her neck one is kind of a, almost a crescent shape and the other is a slightly uh, you know off a circle with potentially a um, turtle cut out of the middle or just a shape and both of them are in a purple tone. Hmm. Anything else oh. to add to that? Well, I just realized, I think you're right. I think that's a turtle inside the shell. And of course, they, indigenous people or the Abedeke people would call this hemisphere Turtle Island. So that is significant. Yes, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. I, I, and thanks for reminding us that this was an important thing for you to share. So, um, yes. Yes, that was. So if there's one thing um, you would want people to know about you and your art, and um, I, I laugh at one thing, but, you know, <laughs> you talk about, you know, you know, what's the one thing you want to leave people who've um, been listening and watching um, today with? That wherever you are and whoever you are, that I hope as you will step out into your day that you will look for beauty and pause and rejoice in it and it might be another person it might be a smile 
It might be even if you live in town and it's a sidewalk, there might be a little roots of grass that are coming up through it. It might be looking at the sun um, to just pause and consider that there is beauty in the midst of all of what we're all also experiencing in different ways of chaos. Um, and the ways the traditions of the Abenaki and the Lakota and other people, there's a strong valuing of things like honesty and generosity and integrity. And generosity is just is, is just really, really important. And I feel during this time, it's really important for us to look around and be aware of others and pause and hopefully find a way we can express a caring and make an effort at connection, especially during this time when we've been so forced to isolate in so many ways. And I am so grateful I've learned to use Zoom, okay? <laughs> that there was this way to learn to reach out um, and to be able to communicate and connect and to be a part of community that we don't have to be limited unless we choose to stay in a limited place. So let's reach out. Thank you, Kate. And thanks for sharing your art and your, your stories and um, you with, with us <laughs> and with the audience today. And um, thank you again. Thank you so much. And I'm just going to push up to that prayer shawl. Uh -huh. And I want to just say to you that um, I was in a place with horses. I went up to a program called Become One with the Spirit of the Horse in South Dakota. And uh, it was very much of a blessing experience. The people that are still living the traditional ways of their people truly are a people of generosity and prayer and community. And we have much we could learn. And I will, add, I will add this. As a result of my going to that place and my sharing with one of her sons who was alcoholic and being able to share about my own trauma but healing from it and the value of horses, this man has now been sober for four years. See, if we care enough and we, we hold on our judgment and are open and be willing to share heart to heart, not only is there more healing for us, but there's healing for others. And I also believe there can be healing for our earth. And that is my hope. I know that's a big one. But um, it's a piece that I could do here on my small farm at the base of the Scutney Mountain. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And so much I've learned from you folks and other artists. And I look forward to when we can gather. I'm intending to get to the gathering when it moves to St. Johnsbury. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that myself.